Can you imagine? Take the coal, cleanse my lips. It's going to be a good time. No, it's going to melt your lips. It's not a pleasant experience. This is a painful experience. This is a mouth that speaks perversity at times. This is a mouth that curses my brother at times. This is a mouth that is estranged from God, that gossips and, and cuts people down and exposes my arrogance and my wicked heart. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Take the coal, cleanse my lips. Here I am. This beautiful moment. Isaiah is transported to this heavenly temple and, and the smoke is billowing into the air and the angels, just like over the ark, are crying, holy, 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 with their wings outstretched. Incense is, is burning and, and Isaiah has a revelation of who God is. The train of his robe fills the temple and he cries out, woe to me. He falls on his face, woe to me, God. I'm a man of unclean lips. That's our response when we come in contact with a holy God. All right, we are in temple um, part nine as we have laid out the past temples of old and understand the layout of those temples, pretty soon we're going to be going into Jesus in the temple. And we only have one um, station left before the altar um, of the Ark of the Covenant. And we're standing now at the altar of incense in Temple Part 9, the last stage before we go behind the veil into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the covenant sits that, that recognizes and presents the manifest presence of God on earth, God's communication and contact to man on earth. And so we have walked through these different stages. We started out in the outer courts. We walked through the only door, the only access into that. We walked then to the brazen altar that we sung about this morning in the song, Take Me In. And that's where you take the life of the sheep, the priest offers it on the sacrifice there as a whole burnt offering or as a, a sin offering. There are a number of uh, offerings in, of, of sacrifice on this that takes place and a number of different animals that are sacrificed um, in your stead for your sin. These were all temporary, looking forward to ultimately a sacrifice that would happen once and for all, the lamb slain from the foundations of the earth. This had to be done perpetually. It had to be done year after year because it wasn't enough to cover. Um, but Jesus, the sinless one, the Messiah, gave his life ultimately as a ransom for many. And so we go then from the brazen altar to the laver and we looked at the fulfillment of Christ in the laver and the washing of hands and feet by the Levitical order. And then we move into the holy place. This is the room um, just outside of the holy of holies. And we stand in the holy place today as we are going to look at the altar of incense. Exodus chapter 30 verse 1 through 10. Let me read that for you if you want to find your place there in Exodus chapter 30, verse 1 through 10. That's going to be our main text today, but we're actually going to be looking at a number of scriptures that pertain to the altar of incense. Make an altar of acacia wood for burning incense. It is to be square. I converted the cubits here. If you're not familiar with what a cubit is, it's from your elbow to your longest finger. It's about 18 inches, about a foot and a half um, from your elbow to your, your middle finger. So those can convert to around roughly 18 inches. So I've converted that for us just so it makes sense. It is, it is to be square, 18 inches by 18 inches and three feet high. It's horns of one piece with it. Overlay the top and all the sides and the horns with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Make two gold rings for the altar below the, the molding, two of each of the opposite sides to hold the poles used to carry it. Make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with pure gold. Put the altar in front of the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant. Before the atonement cover that is over the tablets of the covenant law, where I will meet with you, Aaron must bring fragrant incense on the altar every morning when he tends the lamps. 
he must burn incense again when he lights the lamps at twilight. So the incense will burn regularly before the Lord for the generations to come. But do not offer on this altar any other incense or any burnt offering or grain offering. And do not pour a drink offering on it. Once a year, Aaron shall make atonement on its horns. The annual atonement must be made with the blood of the atoning sin offering for the generations to come. It is most holy to the Lord. This is the prescription given to Moses to implement, to build the altar of incense. This altar of incense we've seen here is about a foot and a half by a foot and a half. So it's, it's, it's square as far as its width. And, um, and then it's three feet tall. So this is a low-lying um, altar, acacia wood, the same wood that we've uh, explored, the hard acacia wood that has insect repellent qualities, this indestructible wood, if there is an indestructible wood, and then overlaying it with gold. Now on this one it's going to be a little different because the altar of incense um, only has two, uh, two rings, one on each rib of the altar. And so, just like seen here, some people would uh, wrongly depict the altar of incense by putting rings on all four corners. This is the lightest of the um, articles of worship. Therefore, it's only needing two rings, one on each rib. And acacia wood poles would go through that. And when the tabernacle was moved, because the tabernacle, the mishkan, was moved um, in the original prescription, tent pegs pulled up, reassembled wherever the children of Israel went. And the twelve tribes surrounded the tabernacle, the mishkan. So those would be slid into those rings and the priests would carry them on their shoulders. Now with the other articles of worship, there are four rings. One on all four corners, um, which helped balance the item and also gave enough strength to carry the heavier items. And so that shows you that this is a smaller altar and weighs less in order to be able to carry it from place to place. According to Jewish tradition, when the incense was burned, you could smell it from a quarter of a mile away. So today I brought with me um, an assimilation of a temple um, recipe. This isn't the exact temple recipe. Uh, mainly you're, what you're going to smell is frankincense. And if you go to the Holy Land to this day and you enter the Holy Sepulcher, this is, this is the kind of thing that you're going to smell in the Holy Sepulcher. To be honest, it brings back fond memories to me because I have been um, to the land of the Bible multiple times and one of my favorite places to be is in the Holy Sepulchre. There the priests walk around with these incense items um, and articles of worship as they offer incense on the incense altar. Um, they usually have them on strings and these strings are, are, and ropes are swinging, and so you see this smoke wafting up into the height of the Holy Sepulcher. And so there are many things that we can do. I can show you guys pictures of the land of the Bible. I could even bring you some of the things. I've eaten the dates of the Bible. I've tasted um, the goat milk of the Bible. Um, but then there are things that also that we can experience, like the smelling of the sweet fragrance. Much like this you would have smelled in the temple. So today, we can see some of these things. We're not going to taste these things today. Maybe we could do that on another occasion. But there are these moments where you can get an idea for what they're smelling in that place. Some of you guys have probably have a different experience with incense. Um, if you grew up in my generation, we typically had um, beaded curtains and incense somewhere in the house, usually to mask a scent um, of something else that was being um, burned. And so what we need to do first of all is remove ourselves from our wor worldview and understand that there is a sweet-smelling fragrance. There is an incense altar where God prescribes a certain recipe in which the children of God would burn inside of the tabernacle. Now. This was a number of different items, one being frankincense, galbanum, um, orarchi, I don't know how to pronounce these exactly, but that would be crushed into fine powder and just like I have placed upon a coal at the incense altar. Now, 
There were also those you, you find that it's said in the Bible that offered profane fire. More than likely, these wicked priests are offering the wrong a recipe of incense on the altar. There was a certain thing, a certain recipe. It was protected and it was only to be burned in the temple because it was deemed sacred. And you're only to experience that in the temple. It's not to be something that's common. Now, I think this is, a, 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 this is good for us to stop here for a minute and, and think about that. Like, our God is not common. And the things that he asked in the temple and the prescription there in the temple that he prescribed to us, he prescribed only for the temple. Because he's not just some common thing. He's not your homeboy. We live in a generation where t-shirts are made that say, Jesus is my homeboy. Yes, he's a friend that sticks closer than any brother. But I think we get to the point where we speak too commonly of him. Because He is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Because He is high and lifted up. He is God and I am not. And so these common things were not mixed into the temple. Well, these wicked priests offered more than likely a wrong recipe on the altar. I would say if we understand incense today, um, in our lives we've probably offered profane fire and not holy fire. Profane smoke and not holy smoke. That the, the incense of our lives, the, the, the smoke that we let rise into the air, was not holy. So we take ourselves, first of all, out of our worldview, we place ourselves in the land of the Bible, and we understand this idea of this burning incense on this altar that was right before the Ark of the Covenant. So here's this progression. You've gone all through these, these methods and rituals and prescriptions, and now you're standing in front of the veil that shields you from the presence of God. And the only thing between you and God is the veil and this altar of incense. This is the connecting point of all of it. This is God connecting with man, and how does He connect with man? David says in Psalm chapter 141, verse 2, My and listen to the wording in this, this temple wording. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Any of those things sound familiar? Where's the evening sacrifice happening? At the brazen altar. Where is incense going up? Where we're standing now in front of the altar of incense. And, and David is relaying this Relating this to prayer, may my prayer be set before you like incense. That this is the connection point with God and man, and you have the opportunity to speak to Him. To let your voice be heard, to let your heart be heard, and your prayers are going up into the heavens. They're, they're ascending upward into a God that hears you. You're standing at the connection point the opportunity that you have to meet with a holy and a righteous God. My question to you is, have you taken that opportunity? There's a lot of different prayers that go out today, and we'll look at those here in a minute. But have you fellowshiped with your God? Because that's what this is all about, all of it. The laver, the table of showbread, the altar, the burnt sacrifice, the outer courts, the inner courts, the holy of holies, the menorah, all of it is for this purpose of connecting creature to creator. It's the reason you were made. And your hearts will be desperately uh, seeking Him until you find Him and are satisfied by Him. So we see that now we have the aroma in the air. Now, if you closed your eyes for a minute and transported yourself through these images that we've shown, we could place ourselves in the Holy of Holies, sensing the smell of the moment, the sweet-smelling fragrance going up to God. First thing I want to look at today is reverence. We're not treating God as something common. He is holy. The best way to do that is in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. Isaiah is going to be speaking of this heavenly place. You see, the temple on earth is a mirror of a heavenly temple. That's what it is. It's, it's the layout of, of a heavenly temple. Um, it's it's, a, it's a, 
a bleak <laughs> representation of it. It's a, it's a, it's a portion of it. Um, the revelation, the full understanding of it is, is far beyond our comprehension. But this is a small look into a heavenly temple. And Isaiah gets the ultimate look into that temple. I want you to hear this. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. What's behind the veil? A mercy seat. The throne of God. And the train of His robe filled what? The temple. Above Him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And the whole earth is filled with His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. What's above the, the mercy seat? Two angels with ring, wings outstretched covering the altar. What does Isaiah see here in the temple, this heavenly temple? He sees the doorpost shaking. The glory of God has filled the, the temple and the whole earth, and the angels are crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We are getting a view into the ultimate temple and the whole temple filled with smoke. What's he talking about? Well, you're going to get a, more of a definition of that now. Woe to me. This is, this is Isaiah. This is his response. Not, what's up, Jesus? Good to see you, God. It's, Woe to me. I cried. I am ruined. That will sound common to me. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips. The whole process of this temple is about the cleansing of, of sin and the removal of sacrifice. And I live among a people of unclean lips. He's viewing a holy God who is pure and undefiled. And He is a man defiled with a wicked heart with unclean lips, and he acknowledges in that moment that, God, you're bigger than me, you're greater than me, you're higher than me. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Have you ever been to that place in worship? Where the revelation of God in, in its fullness, where you're on your face before Him weeping and understanding that he is, he is God and you are not, that He is Creator and you are not. Understanding who you are and understanding who He is. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See this has touched your lips. Your guilt has taken, been taken away and your sin atoned for. So what, what coal is he talking about? Now, every time you read the Scriptures, I pray that I, hopefully you've been able to go this, through this entire series. And if you're new, I hope that later you can get on YouTube and go back and watch all of these in their totality. Because when you're reading Scripture and you understand the, the temple language and you're reading a passage like that, you're, you're, you're there. So, the coal in the incense altar comes from the coals at the brazen altar. So every morning, the, the priest would go in to the menorah where they would tend to its wicks. They would refill the oil because it burned 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. We talked about the menorah. While they were doing that and inside the holy place, they would also uh, take a coal from the brazen altar and they would bring it to the incense altar. And so we've got a coal here. They would take that coal... from the brazen altar and bring it to the incense altar where they would then put the, the incense, as you have already witnessed, on the coal. The coal would then burn the, the incense. So this song that we sang today, Take me into the Holy of Holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me into the Holy of Holies. 
take the coal, cleanse my lips, here I am. This is what Isaiah is pronouncing his, his defilement. He's, he's a creature and God is creator, that he is sinful and God is holy. And God takes the coal, the angel takes the coal, and, and takes it and puts it to his lips. Any volunteers today? I find it kind of amusing at times that we, we sing that song. It's a beautiful song. It comes from Scripture. But do we really understand what it means? I would say 90% of the people that sing that song don't know what it means. Like, this isn't happy, fun time. Take the coal, cleanse my lips, here I am. It's, it's humble. It's broken. There, there, are no, there is no light show besides the flicker of the menorah. <laughs> Can you imagine? Take the coal, cleanse my lips. It's going to be a good time. No, it's going to melt your lips. It's not a pleasant experience. This is a painful experience. This is a mouth that speaks perversity at times. It's a mouth that curses my brother at times. This is a mouth that is estranged from God that gossips and, and cuts people down and exposes my arrogance and my wicked heart. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I implore you all, one day, put yourself on a word fast. Don't wait for it to be put around your neck and just listen to conversation. And at the end of the day, I promise you, you'll be saying this. We are an unclean people. Take the coal, cleanse my lips, here I am. This beautiful moment, Isaiah is transported to this heavenly temple and, and the smoke is billowing into the air and the angels, just like over the ark, are crying, holy, 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 with their wings outstretched. Incense is, is burning and arising. And Isaiah has a revelation of who God is. The train of his robe fills the temple and he cries out, woe to me, he falls on his face, woe to me, God. I'm a man of unclean lips. That's our response when we come in contact with a holy God. That's why people bow during worship. That's why people raise their hands during worship. That's why people weep during worship. Because a revelation happens in their hearts and their lives. And the only response is reverence. Can we really make that cry? Not just some happy-go-lucky song but the real reverence of that moment. God, the, the words that come from my mouth are many times unholy. Take the coal, cleanse my lips. Here I am. Now I want to talk to you for a minute about, about communication. So this is this connection point. This is creature meets with its creator. Understands the reason it exists through his holy word and the washing of the word understands God's intentions and, and love for us, also understands God's justice and judgment. We are coming in contact with a holy God. Prayer, as defined in Webster's Dic Dictionary, says this, a solemn, a solemn request. Prayer is a solemn request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God. Pretty simple. The dictionary would tell us that prayer is a a communication where you're either asking for something or you're thanking Him for something. But I think Webster's got it a little wrong and partly right. There's so much more to prayer. I want you to think for a minute about outer court prayer. Like, outer courts. Like, not even on Temple Mount. <laughs> What, what kind of prayers are outer court prayers? When we're, when we're estranged from God's presence, we're separated from Him by many layers, what, what kind of prayers are those? God, help. Sometimes those prayers aren't good prayers. Sometimes those prayers are blasphemous. It's communication. See, prayer is not just always asking for something or thanking Him for something. Prayer is talking to Him. Simple. Communicating with Him. And just because you're saying something other than asking for something or thanking Him for something doesn't mean it's not prayer. What about the communications that we had toward Him that were blasphemous? That were accusatory? Like, how dare you, God? 
Life's not fair. Forget you. I'll never serve you. What kind of prayers did you make in the outer court? Outside of His presence, away from Him. Man, I've made many. I've screamed at the skies, middle finger raised. Accusing Him for all the wrong that has happened in my life. I've, I've then reached out to Him, the same God that I cursed, in the back seat of a cop car saying, God, if you get me out of this, I'll serve you. I'll give it all to you. If you do this for me, anybody ever make a deal with God? I think that's why every one of you are here, actually. So I, more than that, it's because of God's sovereign plan for my life. But that was part of the process. What, are outer court, what do outer court prayers look like? Cries for desperation as He brings us closer. What do brazen altar prayers look like? Well, the brazen altar is a place for, for sacrifice. It's a place where you're acknowledging the sin in your life and you're acknowledging the only one who can take away that sin. It, the brazen altar prayer is a sacrificial prayer. You're no longer out here accusatory and, and begging for help. You're now there with the revelation of who He is as the sinless sacrifice. And that's what we did this morning. As we break the bread and we, we drink the cup, we are remembering the sacrificial prayer that God, you saved my soul. That God cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Purify me, Lord. And take away my sin. The brazen altar is sacrificial prayer. But then we move on. See, godly sorrow produces repent repentance. This isn't just a prayer in the outer courts that's accusatory. This is a prayer that that has some major results. That ultimately, if you are truly repentant, there will be godly sorrow attached to it. Have you had a revelation of your sin and a revelation of His holiness? Because when you do, that godly sorrow produces repentance. Repentance means to turn away from that old life. It's not just coming to the brazen altar, absolving your sins, going to see an intermediary, a priest, who says, uh, say, five Hail Marys and... Fourth, how art thou fathers, or whatever the prescription is, and, and go your way, and you leave the brazen altar, and you go back out into the outer courts, and you live like the devil. It's not just to come for a minute and have your sins absolved and go back to the same way you live, but godly sorrow produces results. Repentance. If you haven't experienced godly sorrow, my friend, then I pray you receive godly revelation. Because when you know who you are and who He is, your only response will be that of Isaiah's. Woe to me, God. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a man undone. And that kind of sorrow produces change in your life. Then we have the altar of incense. What kind of prayer happens at the altar of incense? First of all, an intimate, relational prayer. That this, this whole process is, is God bringing man close to him. That he, that he died for us to bring us close to God, to reconcile a relationship that has been severed. You don't just reconcile that relationship to go do what you want to do. The, re the relationship is reconciled for a continual communing and fellowship with him. A relational conversation. That is intimate and relational. Uh, uh, an offering that is continual. See, the, the priest did this every morning. They're tending the menorah. They're also offering incense. They come back in the evening to tend the menorah again. They offer incense. It happens twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. And this incense is offered to God perpetually day after day after day, year after year in the temple. In Bible college, my wife was one time rebuked for, uh, for not praying. Um, it's pretty interesting. We were too at times. And I went to a pretty intense Bible college, School of Urban Missions in New Orleans. Great school. Um, intense. We, we did inner city ministry in the, some of the most dangerous neighborhoods in, in America at the time. New Orleans read the, led the murder rate per capita in the United States. It was pre-Katrina. Um, 
New Orleans was a violent place. This school was right there in the heart of it. And we were on the streets daily uh, ministering in, in, in some of the worst places. My wife, um, one time in, in prayer, and this, this school's intense. I mean, like, they met the streets with that same intensity. And one time she's, she's praying, but she's praying internally. And someone, one of the professors or someone rebuked her and got onto her. Is that why, you know, this is a time for prayer. You're supposed to be praying right now. She said, I am. She said, I don't, I, I, your mouth's not moving and you're not saying anything. You're not praying. She says, I'm, I'm praying internally. He says, you can't do that. <laughs> it's nonsense. It's nonsense. The Bible tells us, as a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul tells us that we are to pray without what? Ceasing. To continually pray. Does that mean that Paul every day, all day, wouldn't even have a conversation with you because he was having a conversation with God? Does that mean that, you know, Vinny's over here talking to me, I'm not listening to a word he says because I'm just verbally speaking to God? No, there's an internal prayer that is happening. That prayer is not just verbal, it is verbal, and verbal is a good thing. Matter of fact, if you have a trouble um, paying attention in your prayers, if you start to pray, Lord, I pray for my daughter, I pray for my, my son, Lord, I really pray that you'd unite our family, and, and then you start thinking, you're like, man, you know, my house, I need to fix this fence. You know, I need to, uh, you know, I really need to change the oil today. And then I need, man, I, we didn't get any groceries, man. You know, it's, it, it's about time I better get to talk to the, And by the time you're, you, you've, you've, you've complained and talked more about your troubles of your day at the end of it, and then you realize, man, I, when did I quit praying? Have you ever been there? Your mind wanders like immediately, and you're just like, man, how did I get here? Why am I thinking about eggnog? I was praying for my son. <laughs> right? Like, that, that's our heart, man. We, we, our minds wander and they, they veer. And, and one way to, uh, to, um, to confront that is through verbal prayer. It's to speak the prayer. To find somewhere by yourself where you can just pray to God and talk to Him and, and verbalize it. Because when you then start to think about something else, you'll know it immediately because your mouth will say it. So verbal prayer is a good thing. I'm not saying verbal prayer is not a good thing. It's prayer. Communication with God is a good thing. But communication with God doesn't just happen from your lips. God knows every thought and intent of your heart. Everything you say and do, you are not hidden from Him. We pray without ceasing. Jesus says this when He's raising Lazarus from the dead. He says, Father, I thank you that you hear me and that you always hear me. But I say this for the benefit of the people around me. So he's speaking verbally to God um, about this a conversation to God and he's going to raise Lazarus and he makes it known in that prayer that, God, you hear me and you always hear me. And the only reason I'm verbalizing this is for the people around so that they hear what's being verbalized and they know what's happening here. See, this fellowship with Jesus on earth was without, with, with Jesus to God on earth was without ceasing. It was continual. There's a man named Rabbi Schneider. He's a, he's a teacher that I listen to some. And he says this, walking in supernatural awareness of God is the definition of prayer. Walking in supernatural awareness of God. I want you guys to practice this in your lives. Yes, it's verbal. Yes, that helps us to pay attention. As a matter of fact, the Jewish people, when they, when they pray and stand at the Western Wall, they do it rocking. They rock back and forth. They're reciting prayers and they're, they're holding these uh, seat, seat tassels like ancient rosaries and they're praying. They have all these connection points to engage their minds. They're, they're telling their body, it's time to pray. It's time to pray. Body, listen. We're praying here. They're, they're involving their body in it. They're involving their mouth in it. They're, they're tactile. They're touching something to remember that they're praying. They're, they're engaging and putting all their effort and energy into it. And that's amazing. But prayer is also continual in a supernatural awareness of who God is. I want you to think about that today as you're, as you're saying in product. As you're thanking God for the ability to work. This constant um, cognizance, this understanding of who God is and who you are, and this constant fellowship with Him, that when you're eating food, in your heart you're saying, thank you, God. Yes, you can say it before it, but you should also say it the entire time you're eating it. When you're looking at your brother who's pouring into your life, you can say, thank you, Lord, for this brother. This, always this awareness of who God is as you walk through this earth. That's how we pray without ceasing. And this altar of incense represents 
prayer, this connection to God. Don't let anyone deceive you thinking that prayer is only one thing. That it's only verbal. It is this, quite simply. Communication with God. This is Paul imploring us to pray without ceasing. We walk in supernatural awareness of God. So, then there is this deeper part of prayer that very few people in life experience. And it is this. It's called intercession. That he who knew no sin became sin for us. That Moses, when he's crying for the mercy of his people, he says, God, do not remove their name from your book. If you do, remove my name too. That he puts himself on the line for others. This intercessory prayer that's no longer thanking God just for what He's done, which is amazing, or asking God for things, but a prayer that is, that is putting yourself on the line for others. That's saying, God, save my son. God, would you minister to my brother? Would you heal my wife? That, that you're putting yourself on the line and it's no longer about you, it's about others. Intercessory prayer. Lastly, I want to look at the ultimate teacher on prayer. Because the disciples, so David understands that the incense altar represents prayer. We saw it. He said, let my prayers go up to you like incense and, and my, my praise like the evening sacrifice. See, they understand that the temple is worship, that the, that, the, that the brazen altar is for sacrifice, the incense altar is for prayer, and they are connecting prayer to this moment. Now Jesus at one point is asked, how, how should we pray? Anybody ever asked that? Like, how do I do this? Like, what, what's the recipe? What's the formula in which I am to, in, 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 am to engage God? Well, they asked that to Jesus. Lord, teach us to pray. Would you teach us how to pray? Why are they asking Jesus to teach them how to pray? Because they know that Jesus is a man of prayer. Because they see him steal away time and time again to a high place to praise God and to honor God and to, to speak and commune with the Father. So the first thing Jesus says when they say teach us to pray, he says this. Our Father, this is how you should do it. Let me show you real quick. There's a few points here and we'll end here. Uh, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. How do we start this conversation? With reverence. How does Jesus start the conversation? With reverence. It's the, same, uh, it's the same speech that Isaiah has when he encounters a holy God. It's, it's one of reverence and, and godly fear. Not worldly fear, but a respect and an honor and a reverence for God. That when we first approach Him, that should be our answer as we approach the altar of incense. As we begin to offer incense up to Him. God, you're holy and I'm not. God, hallowed be your name. This hallowing of God's name. So no need to linger there long. We, we understand as we've looked at Isaiah's response there. Then next he says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I find it really interesting that he doesn't just jump right in like, God, you're holy and I'm not. I, I have reverence for you. Hallowed be your name. Now listen, I need this, 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 and this. No, he frames it by this. First of all, by reverence. Secondly, by, by acknowledging that it's not our will that matters. It's God's will. That should frame everything you say after it. Right? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes I think our second response after reverence is hallowing our name. My kingdom come. My will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like, Lord, this is my will. Here you go. Here's the list. I need this, I need this, I need that, and I need this. And if this doesn't happen, this can't happen. You guys are excellent strategy uh, at strategy, I'm sure, and really could give God a hand on how to handle things. Um, it's not the case. <laughs> it's not what he, he... He doesn't go in immediately to his needs and understanding what he wants. He has to first acknowledge to God, I don't know what I need. <coughs> you do. It's not about my kingdom on earth. It's not about what I want. It's about what you want. And really, if you can't get past that, you can't get past that. 
If you're going to stop there, then you're going to stop there. If you're going to stop at your needs and your wants, you're never going to progress any farther. Can you really get to that place where your entire life is laid down? Like, God, really, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, in my life, as it is in heaven. Your will, your kingdom. Or have you already got it all figured out? You come with, this is typically what we do, we don't come for His plan, we come with our plan. Here you go, Lord, here's the list. We should start like this, crumbling that list up, throw it in the garbage, say, my list is garbage, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Man, and that hurts, man. There's a reason we don't get past that point, because we're selfish. And we pretend that we know what God wants to do in our lives. But have you really gotten to the place in prayer where you say, God, my entire life is laid bare before you. If you don't want me to take the family's business, if my marriage erupts in shambles, if everything falls apart, if I go to prison, no matter what, God, your kingdom come, your will be done in my life. I don't know if there's anything more true in Teen Challenge because we have so many worries and so many fears What we're going to do when we get out. How we're going to do this and how we're going to do that. It's not about your plan. It's not about your will. And only until you get to that place where you're surrendering to His kingdom come, His will be done, you will progress no further. Everything after that is framed by His will, not mine. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, Now we're asking for provision. It's okay to ask for provision, but it's not okay to skip His plan and His will in your life. Once you get to that place where you can truly surrender to His will, then we can get to that place where we we understand the provision of God. And I love this because, you know, we preach against the prosperity gospel and the the misuse of Scripture and, and the bless me now culture. And that's all true. But this is also true. God cares about your sustenance. God cares about daily bread. Jesus is teaching on prayer, and this is one of the major points. A concern for you, for your family, for your well-being, for your nutrition. Now, it doesn't say, give us this day our daily ribeye, our daily lamb chop, our daily sea bass, with asparagus grilled to perfection and mashed taters. (laughs) It speaks of daily provision. God is concerned about daily bread. He's concerned about your provision. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. Jesus taught on it. Now, does that mean that, that, that all your wildest dreams will come true? No, we've already established that. It's not your will. It's His will. It's His kingdom, not yours but He cares about daily provision. And it's okay to pray for daily provision for your wife who's at home working two jobs and watching the kids while you're here. One of the hardest things I had to surrender is my wife was working two jobs, watching kids while I was going through the program. It's a hard moment as a man to relinquish that control for His kingdom come, His will be done. But once we get to that point, men, we pray for His provision. Next, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's what we did today in communion. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us, Lord, of our sin. It's part of it. This is the brazen altar. This is a sacrificial prayer. Lord, I am sinful. You are not. You took my place. Forgive me of our sin, my sins. But it doesn't just stop there. It's why we practice open confession in our communion. That we allow men to speak up and say, hey, I did this wrong. Would you guys forgive me? Or to walk to your brother and put your hand on his shoulder and say, hey, I was out of line the other day. Forgive me for the way I talked to you and for raising my voice. That this is not just asking for things. This is giving things that we're asking for. Because if we want God to forgive us, how much more should we forgive those made in His image? You see, the Bible tells us if you go to the altar and there you realize that your brother has, has a, a, a disagreement with you, and there's aught between you, there's friction between you, 
to leave your gift at the altar and to go make it right with your brother. What altar is he talking about? The altar at the temple. When you're going to offer that offering to the priest, he's going to offer it on the brazen altar. And there you remember, oh yeah, Jedediah back home. I really talked smack to him the other day. Man, I, I, let me go all the way back to Capernaum and find him. It's a three-day three journey back at its fastest. Let me leave my gift there, go back and ask my brother to forgive me, and then walk all the way back to Jerusalem three days in a six-day journey, maybe seven if it took me a day to find Jehoiakim. <laughs> and then I come back and I'm like, okay, now I'm ready, Lord. All right, have you been there? Or when you go to God to ask for, for forgiveness, are you accusatory toward your brother? Like, man, this idiot Lord, you see the way he talked to me the other day? Man, I really, I'm so sick of this guy. Would you, would you help me to, to, to be able to stand this knucklehead? No, it's not, it's, he's not asking you to dump all your garbage on him. It's not that he doesn't hear those things and he doesn't have mercy on us when we do those things, but it would be better for you just to go ahead and, oh, Lord, my heart. I'm angry at him, I'm bitter at him, and there's friction between us. I'm going to leave this here, Lord. I'm going to go back and I'm going to forgive him and I'm going to make it right. I'm going to take that long journey there and then come all the way back and then offer my sacrifice on the altar. Anybody ever walk seven days to make something right with your brother so you can make it right with God? Come on. Or our hearts so wicked and angry and e egomaniacal, arrogant, that we can't even voice it looking in their eyes who's right across the pew from you. How many of us would walk all the way back to ask for forgiveness? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Jesus ends this prayer. This is, this is very concise. Reverence. Your will, not mine. Daily bread. Giving forgiveness and receiving forgiveness. And lastly, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. He ends this prayer as Jesus is teaching his disciples, as Peter is sitting there listen, listening, and, and Simon the zealot who once waged war as, as a zealot is listening, and Andrew is listening, and Jesus is teaching them, and they're hanging on his every word, and he's saying to them, this is how you pray. He ends it this way. That after all that, Lord, I'm, I'm going out into the day today. I've just burned this incense on the altar this morning. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to perform a task. And at this point, God, I pray you protect me as I go out. As I leave this place of prayer with you. This intimate moment that I will continue in prayer throughout the day, and that as I walk through the day, those temptations that are of the devils, you will expose. The conversations that are of the devil, you would expose. That the stumbling blocks that have been put in my way, you would expose. You would lead me away from temptation. That you would not allow me to be tempted, Lord, in things that will break me. That you remove me from this danger. And deliver me from the evil one. In the ending of this, Jesus is recognizing there's a source for evil. There's a source for unclean lips. There's a source for profane prayers. And it's the evil one. That the, ultimately, the tongue is set on fire by hell. And the acknowledgement at the end of this prayer is, Lord, I'm going out. Protect me as I go today. Remove the stumbling blocks. I realize that there is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Would you guard me and keep me, God? Would you help me to walk in this world upright and avoid temptation? I know, Lord, that you will always provide a way out. You see, Jesus was teaching them to pray. So my last question to you today as we end this chapel is this. What kind of aroma is in your temple. Does it smell like three-day-old lawn care? Does it smell like vile incense? Because the Bible says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You. Yeah, you. 
You woke up this morning, you pull your tent, tent pegs up, and you, just like the original prescription given to Moses, you walk through this life and you're offering up incense to the Lord. What do your prayers look like? Does it look like the, the layout that Jesus gave? Or is it filled with worry and fear and bitterness and anger and prejudice? What is the aroma in your temple? Is it quick to anger? Your words, your actions. You see, today, as we stop for a moment at the incense altar, our last stop before we go beyond the veil to where God is, we stand in front, we have audience with God, our prayers go up, and I love this because it rises as it leaves your consciousness, as it leaves your lips, that your prayers do not bounce off the ceiling, they continue upward. That He does care about your daily bread and provision. That when you, when you walk through that prayer, He's concerned for you. He gave His life for you. And I ask that today, as you're walking through this world, as you're walking through Lawton, as you're walking through the thrift store, that, that this continual aroma would rise. And when you would start to notice that it's not the, the scent that you're looking for, that you would stop for a minute and say, Lord, forgive me. That's that continual prayer. God, I shouldn't have talked like that. Walking away and just quickly coming back to Him. Constantly coming back to Him over and over and over and over again. Not being satisfied with the vile stench that fills many temples. But allowing praise and honor and, and good things to come from your lips. And to pour from the abundance of your heart. Love and compassion and peace and kindness. And, a, and, a, and when it leaves your mouth and you realize it's not that. Get it back. <laughs> Whoops. Lord, forgive me for this. Let's bow our heads. God, we love you and we thank you for the object lessons in your word. The Lord, we enter beyond into the holy place. We stand in front of the, the veil that, that shields us from your glory, from your wrath, from your justice. But we also realize that you've given us audience, God. What a privilege and an honor that we take advantage of some, so many times. And we just don't take advantage of. God, we need you. God, I pray right now, these prayers that are coming from my mouth, the prayers that are coming from these men's hearts, they do not bounce off the ceiling, but they rise to the heavens. The devil can't stop it. God, we thank you that the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man it avails much. It rises to your ears, to your nostrils. God, we thank you today for the opportunity to have audience with you. We stand in front of this altar and we offer up our praise and our thankfulness, our, our own forgiveness, Lord, laid down only by your blood. God, would you teach us to pray just as you did your disciples? And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Have a good day.